This is section 92 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dinner Speech First Banquet, Missouri Society of New York, Hotel Waldorf Astoria, May 28, 1901. Read by John Greenman. I have been as much impressed as has the chairman by Mr. Spencer's speech, and confused also. Statistics always have that effect. As they rise higher and higher to the sky, they become in the same proportion more and more inexplicable. I was glad when I heard it stated that Missouri had turned out twenty-five million mules. It's from Missouri, and it is expected to be believed. When I was young and in Missouri, I could believe such things. <clears throat> it was a habit. But now that I have come to this grave part of the country, where the people rely largely upon truth, it is not to be expected. I don't know what this Louisiana purchase is, but if they have appropriated in some questionable manner twenty-five millions, I suppose they propose to use it for the purchase of Louisiana. They ought to know that they can't have Louisiana for this money. This glorifying of St. Louis is likely to have a bad effect upon you because it is likely to raise your pride in your state. But there is room for it between here and the zenith. You must keep these things in bounds. George Washington was a Missourian. He was that, not by accident of birth, but by his primacy in the achievement of liberty and the other great things he did for his country. That made him a Missourian. Caesar was a Missourian. They are all Missourians by right. Abraham Lincoln, Robert E. Lee, General Grant, they are all Missourians by right of their achievements. We have soldiers in plenty by that right. John Hay has by that right become a half Missourian. He lived in that state for a short time. I, in my quality as lay preacher, say, live your lives in virtue, that when you come to lay your life down, you shall not descend, but ascend to Missouri. End of Dinner Speech, read by John Greenman. This is section 93 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Speech-Making Experiment Bar Harbor, Maine, August 14, 1901 Read by John Greenman Now here at my side sits a young lady to whom I have given nineteen lessons, and I will prove to you that she is an expert. When I call for a number one, she'll not make the mistake of furnishing a number four, which would be overdoing it. When I call for number ten, number fourteen, and so on, you will see the exactly proper and requisite sunset flush rise in these beautiful cheeks. There, just that casual little remark, you see, brings a number two. Now, if you will look into her lovely blue eyes, if you will examine her charming features, her satin skin, her tawny hair, the fine intelligence which beams in her face, but there now, look at that. Here, where I touch her cheek with my finger, an inch in front of her dainty ear is the meridian which marks the degrees reaching from one to five. See the color steal toward five? 
and now it crosses it keep your eye on it i move my finger forward toward her delicate nostril see the rich blood follow it when i tell you that here is the loveliest form the loveliest spirit that perhaps exists in the world today that she is a darling of the darlings but i need go no further the blush has reached her nostril and her collar and is a number sixteen the most engaging blush the most charming blush the most beautiful blush that can adorn the face of any earthly angel uh, save and except uh, number thirty one which is the last and final possibility and it is called the san francisco or the combined earthquake and conflagration i will now produce that blush end of speech making experiment read by john greenman this is section ninety four of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain two political speeches noonday meeting order of acorns three fifty broadway new york october twenty ninth nineteen o one read by john greenman i have been ill it was indiscriminate eating i ate a banana thinking that by doing so i might conciliate the italian party of our population and prevail upon them to vote the fusion ticket gentlemen it was a tammany banana now a tammany banana is a strange thing the first nibble of it is white and pure but all the rest of it is rotten and will contaminate we all have respect for mr shepherd he is the pure part of the banana but all the rest of the tammany ticket is rotten and the best we can do is to get rid of the whole tammany banana shepherd and all i have eaten only one banana but i still feel as if i had swallowed a whole bunch of tammany tigers and they were wrestling for the spoils in my interior new york has eaten the tammany banana and needs a doctor i think i can introduce to you a competent one in dr seth low after low's brief speech shouts of twain twain brought mark twain up again to say a few words about the order of acorns then he concluded with the remarks below you have heard in a vague way of the red light cadets they are crocker's knights who went out into the new england states and lured young innocent girls into houses of ill fame in this city things are going on in this city which would disgrace any community in the civilized or uncivilized world new york has far exceeded sodom and gomorrah if you do not know about the wickedness of those cities it only goes to show your lack of biblical knowledge sodom and gomorrah were well enough in their time but tammany could have given them points end of two political speeches read by john greenman this is section ninety five of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain mock eulogy of tammany acorns election jubilee new york november sixth nineteen o one read by john greenman it is a victory as was suggested in the letter you have read a success in part prophetic 
the old gang has been defeated all along the line and i prophesy because i was born a prophet that the next time we go to the polls we go there one hundred thousand strong i am not surprised at the superb majority we had what surprises me is that tammany got a single vote with the entire pulpit and almost the entire press against it but while a thirty thousand majority was not nearly large enough we will not quarrel with tammany about the result tammany is dead and it is no use to quarrel with a corpse we are not here to attend the funeral of tammany tammany is dead and there is wailing in the land we shall miss so many familiar faces van wyck the gentle peddler of life-saving ice at sixty cents per hundred is gone ike from we shall never see from again he is gone his name isn't german but i suppose he took it from the germans we shall never see his gentle face again and unger yes he is also gone unger is a german name also in the original it had an h in it yes unger is gone with his great appetite unsatisfied and murphy that shadow of a shadow that political spectre farewell to murphy he is gone to the unsolidified space of which he has been so long a part and devery that indescribable he has gone to the realms of darkness his character is so black that even egyptian darkness would make white spots on it and there is asa bird gardener who said to hell with reform well his reform has been started in the way indicated and we do not care how soon he goes the same way and last but not least there is crocker crocker he can now go back to england we can spare him here yes farewell to crocker forever the baron of wantage the last and i dare say the least desirable addition to english nobility end of mock eulogy of tammany read by john greenman This is section 96 of Mark Twain speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Speech. Good Citizenship Association, East Side Settlement House, New York, November 7, 1901. Read by John Greenman. I may have taken Mr. Gordon for a bunco steerer. He had the light in his eyes which told me that he wanted something out of me i am however very glad to be here with you captured i have been too busy to prepare an address and will read from a recent magazine article of mine telling how a chimney sweep got the ear of the emperor it explains how watermelon is a cure for dysentery there are many remedies most people know little about incidentally the impossible may happen you go to the drug store to get something to keep the hair from falling out beware of drug stores my hair was rapidly leaving me and i spoke to a friend of mine a very old and wise man like myself he told me that if i would just plow my hair twice a day with a stiff brush it would be all right i have not lost a hair in eleven years 
and there is quite some of it i told the remedy to our pastor in hartford one saturday night he was through with the preparation of his sermon and saw a bottle on the dressing table he took it for a hair restorer and forgot about plowing the hair with a brush in the morning his hair was green he had used a very good hair dye he had to preach the sermon but the congregation wondered about his hair and forgot about the sermon for eight years i was troubled with indigestion which took the form of an insurrection in my stomach after i went to bed the various things i thought were good things began quarreling among themselves and trying to agree upon a fusion ticket that would win out four years ago i was in a foreign land where there were no drug stores so i had to resort to the swedish cure which does not allow one to take medicine therefore i used carbonate of soda every night when the heartburn came on i took a handful of it one night when i had no soda i said to myself i would rather stand the pain purely by accident i stretched myself on my left side and curiously enough the pain passed away i made the same experiment several times with the same result when i went to london i spoke to my friend who is the secretary of the royal medical society and asked him why the heartburn passed away when i lay on my left side he said he didn't know well that was in a place where doctors were passing through each day by the hundred and i asked him to see if any of them could tell me none of them could one doctor a very famous one no less than sir william thompson said he remembered hearing of it fifty years ago when his own heartburn was cured that way by an old man in germany but he had never thought of it since there was a case where a simple and certain cure was in his hands and yet he had forgotten it and emptied drug stores into his patients without result he concluded by reading his story how the chimney sweep got the ear of the emperor published by the century magazine november 1901 jimmy a chimney sweep tells his friend tommy that a ripe watermelon is a sure cure for the emperor's ailment which has baffled the royal physicians the boys get word to the palace by telling the butcher who tells the old chestnut seller who tells a rich aunt who tells a friend who tells a sergeant of police who tells the captain and so the word is passed via magistrate mayor master of hounds head groom and others until it reaches the page who fans flies off the emperor and who tells his highness the watermelon treatment succeeds end of speech read by john greenman this is section ninety seven of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain dinner speech lotus club dinner for joseph h choate new york november sixteenth nineteen o one read by john greenman mr carnegie has told you that on the other side of the water they consider it necessary to train men for the diplomatic service and he also suggested that on this side we did not find it necessary to do that but had been able to produce ready-made diplomats when occasions required and i have waited and i have listened and i have 
expected to hear somebody tell an anecdote which has not been told and it becomes necessary for me to tell it you have heard that anecdote many times and you will hear it many more times but you have never known perhaps its historic significance you have never known how much was bound up in that anecdote the greatness of this country rests upon two anecdotes the first was of the time when young george washington told his father about the little hatchet when he was eight years of age long ago in seventeen forty and that anecdote produced one of the foundations upon which the greatness of america rests the foundation of true speaking which is a characteristic of the nation and then the other one the other anecdote which as i shall show you produced the other great feature of this country that is the prosperity the material prosperity of this country which dates from so short a time back the largest portion of it underlies that anecdote i refer to a time when his excellency the guest of the evening was engaged in a lawsuit and he had as his pal a hebrew lawyer of great ability and in the process of skinning the client or rather when it was over when they had won the suit or lost it they didn't know which they were not particular the main thing was to come yet and that was to collect a bill for their services in skinning the man services is the term used by that craft to signify the kind of function which they perform a diplomatic expression for things diplomatic in their nature and the hebrew lawyer uh, mr choate's correspondent proposed to make out the bill and he did he made out a bill for five hundred dollars for these services so called and submitted it to his confederate for his criticism and mr choate said perhaps i had better attend to that myself and the next day mr choate made out a bill and collected it and handed to this friend of his five thousand dollars and said that is your half of the loot and this simple little hebrew was profoundly touched and he said looking up with deep reverence almost thou persuadest me to be a christian now many laughed which was right but the deep thinkers didn't merely laugh they stopped to think and they said there that is a rising man that man has in him qualities which deserve high place that man must be rescued from the law and consecrated to diplomacy for they said when a man has the capacity to take care of his private advantage like that when he has this quality in such generous measure then he only needs spreading it and in this case there seems to be enough to spread out and it can cover and take care of the advantages of the world the commercial advantages of a great nation will not suffer in that man's keeping they kept their eyes upon that rising man and the time came when they said we require a man now that america has grown so great with perhaps seventy or eighty millions of people we require a man now not to take care of the moral character of america before the world for washington and his anecdote have done that we require a man 
to take care of her commercial well-being they saw with their prophetic eyes the significance of that anecdote they foresaw that out of that would grow commercial prosperity for this country by that quality so ripe and complete which would last down 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 the centuries until this country's prosperity has attained its summit and has been so firmly established upon eternal foundations and so it has proved mr choate has carried that quality with him to england and as mr carnegie says he has worked like a mole underground we say that the mole has been doing great and good service he tried himself to tell you what he did there he started to three or four times uh, but didn't reveal anything except the reason that brought him to this country as to his services over there that they have been more than merely suggestive we know for he has been there only three years and now you see the results why american railroad iron is so cheap in england that the poorest families can have it for breakfast he has so tickled those ministers that cabinet of england when he has seemed to be spending these weekends as they call it over there referred to here tonight when he has been simply socially conversing perhaps he has been really pushing canal schemes and working the monroe doctrine successfully spreading the commerce of this country for these three years and now you know the result foreign commerce with the united states has augmented by tenfold twenty and thirtyfold even and he has depressed english commerce in the same ratio brethren the principle underlying the anecdote of the lawyer and the principle of the man was the principle which guided his course and that principle was the principle of give and take that is diplomacy give one and take ten as a result we have in the one anecdote the character of this nation for truth for veracity for absolute trustworthiness when a man speaks established upon everlasting foundations that is the moral character of the country no man can budget while that anecdote of washington and his hatchet lasts and mr choate has placed the country upon the same perpetual foundation or substratum by the principle involved in that other anecdote and as long as this club shall swing amongst the other stars and constellations and what not that make night beautiful so long as they shall last this country's moral character is safe on the one foundation and its commercial prosperity is safe on the other we owe to mr choate a vast debt of gratitude for what he has done in england this whole nation owes him a vast debt of gratitude let us with all our hearts strengthen his hands and in all sincerity thank him do our share in thanking him and paying our share of the great debt right here and now end of dinner speech read by john greenman this is section ninety eight of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain scotch humor one hundred forty fifth annual dinner st andrew society delmonico's new york november thirtieth nineteen o one read by john greenman
the president of st andrews the lord rector of dublin uh, no uh, glasgow isn't it no well he is higher up than i thought he was told me that scotch humor is non-existent how is he a lord rector anyway what does he know about ecclesiastics i suppose he don't care so long as the salary is satisfactory i have never examined the subject of humor until now i am surprised to find how much ground it covers i have got its divisions and frontiers down on a piece of paper i find it defined as a production of the brain as the power of the brain to produce something humorous and the capacity of perceiving humor the third subdivision is possessed by all english-speaking people even the scotch even the lord rector is humorous he has offered of his own motion to send me a fine lot of whiskey that is certainly humor goldsmith said that he had found some of the scotch possessed wit which is next door to humor he didn't over urge the compliment josh billings defined the difference between humor and wit as that between the lightning bug and the lightning there is a conscious and unconscious humor that whiskey offer of the lord rector's was one of unconscious humor a peculiarity of that sort is a man is apt to forget it i have here a few anecdotes to illustrate these definitions i hope you will recognize them i like anecdotes which have had the benefit of experience and travel those which have stood the test of time those which have laid claim to immortality here is one passed around a year ago and twelve years old in its scotch form a man receives a telegram telling him that his mother-in-law is dead and asking shall we embalm bury or cremate her he wired back if these fail try dissection now the unconscious humor of this was that he thought they'd try all of the three means suggested anyway an old scotch woman wrote to a friend first the child died then the callant for the benefit of those not scotchmen here i will say that a callant is a kind of shepherd dog that is this is the definition of the lord rector who spends six months in his native land every year to preserve his knowledge of its tongue another instance of unconscious humor was of the sunday school boy who defined a lie as an abomination before the lord and an ever-present help in time of trouble that may have been unconscious humor but it looked more like hard cold experience and knowledge of facts then you have the story of the two fashionable ladies talking before a sturdy old irish washerwoman one said to the other where did you spend the summer oh at long branch was the reply but the irish there oh the irish where were you she asked her companion in turn at saratoga but the irish there oh the irish then spoke up the old irish woman and asked why didn't you go to hades you wouldn't have found any irish there let me tell you now of a case of conscious humor it was of william carey late of the century 
who died a few weeks ago a man of the finest spirit and thought one day a distinguished american called at the century office there was a new boy on duty as sentry he gruffly gave the gentleman a seat and bade him wait a short time after mr carey came along and said why what are you doing here after explanations mr carey brought out three pictures one of washington one of lincoln and one of grant now young man he said to the boy didn't you know that gentleman now look at these pictures carefully and if any of these gentlemen call show them right in i am grateful for this double recognition i find that like st andrew my birthday comes on the thirtieth of november in fact i was sixty-six years old about thirty-four minutes ago it was cold weather when i was born what a chance there was of my catching cold my friends never explained their carelessness except on the plea of custom but what does a child of that age care for custom end of scotch humor read by john greenman this is section ninety nine of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain dinner speech yale alumni association dinner allen hall hartford january thirty first nineteen o two read by john greenman i didn't want to be invited and the reason was i wanted to come and couldn't come if invited as i pledged myself last summer that i wouldn't accept any invitation outside of new york except to funerals i have no toast no text and therefore it is fortunate that i was so long a resident of hartford and a member of the monday evening club and if you don't know what the peculiarities of that club are i will tell you it was to take men who were not born to speak and never could be made to speak so that they could get up at any time and speak no member of the club could speak for more than ten minutes it has also taught colonel green who could always talk on emptiness and veracity we took charlie clark when he didn't know anything and couldn't tell it and now he can president smith is a graduate of the club there is a man for whom we all have great regard and who can get up here and talk for all the four hundred and seventy nine colleges in the country he has tried to make us believe that he knows all about them and has even suggested that president hadley be made an admiral he could never have done it without the training he received in the monday evening club he also tries to make you believe that he believes what he says he does i knew all these people for about thirty years and remember that colonel green there learned the use of sentences there were other able men dunham and colonel cheney green used to talk the ten minutes and wind up his graceful sentences with an explosion grand and effective twitchell also is a graduate of the club who learned the spirit of self-sacrifice and when he got on a subject he couldn't understand used to talk on it and pass it along to the next then we had judge hammersley who i hope is not here he was trained in the club and his utterances were learned there he would talk and when he got to the end there would be a great explosion green would go voyaging around after a german verb 
and when he had found that german verb would come back and let us have it burton the great-hearted dr nathaniel burton was also a member of the club he had the most wonderful vocabulary and would sit with his great head bowed and when one of us finished would arouse and say there she blows green would make you believe that he knew what he was talking about and you would believe him but he didn't i was in the club thirty years ago and was then the greatest man in it i never came across so great a man then there was dr bushnell that great mind he resigned from the club before i joined it and when i afterwards saw him he was feeble in body but his great mind and great heart were as big and full of loving kindness as ever the text above is incomplete in additional remarks he thanked yale for the honorary degree of doctor of letters conferred upon him along with aldridge cable howells and gilder at the university's bicentennial celebration in october of nineteen o one he also said that yale needed only a monday evening club to become famous End of dinner speech read by john greenman this is section one hundred of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain dinner speech twentieth anniversary dinner society of medical jurisprudence hotel savoy new york march eighth nineteen o two read by john greenman it is a pleasure to watch a company of gentlemen in that condition which is peculiar to gentlemen who have had their dinners <laughs> that was a time when the real nature of man came out as a rule we go about with masks we go about looking honest and we are able to conceal ourselves all through the day but when the time comes that man has had his dinner then the true man comes to the surface i could see it here this evening i noticed the burst of applause when judge o'brien got up to speak and i knew that he was either an exceedingly able man or else that a lot of you practice in his court you have been giving yourselves away all evening one speaker got up here and urged you to be honest and there was no response now i want you to remember that medicine has made all its progress during the past fifty years one member of this society sent me a typewritten judicial decision of the year eighteen o nine in a medical case with the suggestion that this was the kind of medicine to have and that the science of medicine had not progressed but gone back this decision went on and described a sort of medicine i used to take myself fifty years ago and which was in use also in the time of the pharaohs and all the knowledge up to fifty years ago you got from five thousand years before that i now hold in my hand jane's medical dictionary published in seventeen forty five in that book there is a suggestion as to what medicine was like a long time ago how many operations that are in use now were known fifty years ago they were not operations they were executions i read in this book the case of a man who died from a severe headache why severe the man was dead didn't that cover the ground 
this book goes on to say a certain merchant about fifty years of age of a melancholy habit and deeply involved in affairs of the world was during the dog days with a capital d seized with a violent pain of his head which some time after kept him in bed i being called remember this man was a regular ordered venesection in the arms bleeding i also ordered the application of leeches to the vessels of his nostrils i also ordered the application of leeches to his forehead and temples and also behind his ears now you see he has got him fringed all over with leeches but that was not enough for he goes on to say i likewise ordered the application of cup glasses with scarification on his back now he has township maps carved all over him and all this is for a headache but notwithstanding these precautions the man dies or rather perhaps i might have said because of these precautions the man dies now this physician goes on to say if any surgeon skilled in arterial anatomy had been present i should also have ordered an operation he was not satisfied with what he had done with the precautions he had already taken but he wanted apparently to put a pump into that man and pump out what was left now all that has passed away and modern medicine and surgery have come in medicine was like astronomy which did not move for centuries when a comet appeared in the heavens it was a sign that a prince was going to die it was also a sign of earthquakes and of pestilence and other dreadful things but they began to drop one thing after another they finally got down to earthquakes and the death of a prince as the result of the appearance of a comet until in eighteen eighteen a writer in the gentleman's magazine found at least one thing that a comet was sent for because it was of record that when the comet appeared in eighteen eighteen all the flies in london went blind and died now they had got down to flies in eighteen twenty nine a clergyman found still one thing that a comet was sent for because while it was in the heavens all the cats in westphalia got sick but in eighteen sixty eight that whole scheme was swept away and the comet was recognized to be only a pleasant summer visitor and as for the cats and flies they never were so healthy as they were then from that time dates the great step forward that your profession has taken end of dinner speech read by john greenman this is section 101 of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain remarks hannibal high school graduation exercises park theater may 30th 1902 read by john greenman it should have been my privilege to have been here a year ago i received an invitation then from the high school and i want to thank you now for that invitation i appreciated it and i would have accepted it had it not been that infirmity that infirmity which has pursued me all my life and will pursue me to the end an infirmity that is called by many names and that is well in plain english laziness 
it was not born with me i acquired it in hannibal i acquired many things here and among others laziness which is now complicated with old age i should have been here but long ago i took a distaste to traveling on land i don't mind a sea voyage and if i could have come by water i should have come this may not seem to you a sufficient excuse but it is it is sufficient to me my weakness came upon me and i yielded i have come now i am older now besides i have been invited to come to columbia to have a degree conferred upon me by the university of my native state to be made a doctor of laws i seem peculiarly fitted for that avocation i say i received an invitation from columbia in form it was an invitation but in spirit it was a command for me to come and receive a degree which i have not earned i appreciate the compliment however and obey the command of the university all the learning that i acquired to fit me for that degree i received at a little schoolhouse here in hannibal presided over by mrs hoare mrs torrey mr dawson and mr cross they qualified me and it was no sunday job there were difficulties in the way of the process in going around over hannibal today i notice great differences between the hannibal of today and that of two generations ago among other things i notice a difference in matters of intellectual taste i noticed at the presbyterian church this afternoon that the style of oratory has changed in my day the speakers made more noise their oratory was bombastic full of gesticulation pounding the pulpit and all sorts of exterior suggestions of sense combined with the utter absence of that quality today i discovered as i discover here tonight that the speakers had the modern grace of expression the felicity of phrasing every sentence charged with an idea this was true of every speech and i don't even include my own i don't make addresses on fifteen minutes notice but i think if i had three or four weeks preparation i could have done just as well as they did i i think i could i was glad and proud to be in a presbyterian pulpit in hannibal many and many a time in my boyhood days here i went to the presbyterian church by request and often and often in those days i desired earnestly to stand in that presbyterian pulpit and give instructions but i was never asked until today my ambition of two generations ago has been satisfied at last in those old days at cross's school we had exhibitions once or twice a year and here too i notice a difference these young ladies to-night had grace in their delivery and originality in their productions i say young ladies for i wonder why the superior sex is in such a limited sort of minority it is not so in life it may be this is all you have but get more however i must compliment these young gentlemen too for arriving at this in the face of so much opposition but as i was saying in those old days whenever there was an exhibition 
all ages and both sexes took part if there had been a dozen sexes they would all have taken part but there was never any instance where any speech had the least atom of originality and a pupil that studied latin there was one boy george robards who attained that great solitary eminence that alpine summit george robards studied latin perhaps as many as twenty-five of you have reached that height yes there was a difference in what we did instead of original work such as you have for the most part presented here tonight in what we did there was not a line of original thought or any originality of expression it would have been thought there was something the matter with a boy or girl who would attempt such a thing we had recitations not culled out of literature but a certain number and these same ones were all recited every time they were all poetry but one and they were not tame poetry either they were poems full of fire and action that one prose selection was recited every time it was give me liberty or give me death i never tried that one but i believe i could repeat it now word for word from having heard it so often then by the other boys we had three pieces of poetry one was the assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold and his cohorts were gleaming with purple and gold another was lochiel lochiel beware of the day when the lowlands shall meet you in battle array for a field of the dead rushes red on my sight and the clans of culloden were scattered in flight but the one poem that was never omitted the one poem that saved the intellectual life of hannibal at that time the standby that was never never absent from any program was the boy stood on the burning deck today it has been so pathetic to shake the hand and look into the eye of old gray-headed boys and imagine for i could imagine them saying the boy stood on the burning deck i must have met a half dozen of these boys today who used to recite it and always in the same way they never departed from their model why i have stood on that burning deck with that ancient mariner that introduced me this evening as many as a hundred times and without any fire insurance either now this seems a strange way to identify a boy but a couple of years ago when i was away off on the other side of the world on a british india steamer sailing on the bay of bengal from ceylon to bombay no that isn't right but you must not hold me responsible for my geography i acquired it in hannibal a fellow on an outgoing steamer shouted hello mark i answered hello yourself and see how you like it who are you he said don't you remember cross's school in hannibal i used to recite the boy stood on the burning deck now how should i know who he was there was not a boy in hannibal who did not recite it it was a cold day when there was not a half dozen boys to recite it i have been told that i am to distribute diplomas now i never distributed 
any diplomas before therefore i can do it with greater confidence there is nothing that saps one's confidence as the knowing how to do a thing i am going to distribute these as they come and you may toss up for them afterwards you see i am frank and open about it always be frank and open as miss fisher said punch in the presence of the passenger i would suggest that while i am delivering these diplomas that the ancient mariner recite for you the boy stood on the burning deck i am helping him if i had not consented to do this he would have had to do it himself mark twain accompanied his haphazard distribution of diplomas with such remarks as that's a nice one take that one and we want these to go round then prolonged cheering brought him to the front for a brief conclusion i thank you very much indeed for this just appreciation of what my friend the ancient mariner and i have tried to do for you we wanted you to be pleased and it seems to meet with your appreciation i thank you for him and for myself end of remarks read by john greenman this is section 102 of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain speech university of missouri commencement columbia june 4 1902 read by john greenman i have been in missouri for about a week and it seems very like it did a long time ago it has been so pleasant to me notwithstanding the fact that it has been an intensely emotional week i have come back after so long an absence and have spent that week in a town which was a small village when i left there as a small boy and you can conceive of what it must be to meet face to face old men and old women whom you have not seen for sixty years i looked in the faces of women faces clothed in wrinkles and whose heads were as gray as mine faces which when i last saw them were beautiful with the peach bloom of early youth now on their heads the frosts of age and in their faces wrinkles and the weather-beaten look not that which comes from exposure to bad weather i experienced emotions that i had never expected and did not know were in me i was profoundly moved and saddened to think that this was the last time perhaps that i would ever behold those kind old faces and dear old scenes of my childhood i have been through all of that in the last week and while it has been to me a blessed thing while it has charged me with feelings which i would have been glad to have felt yet it has been intensely emotional i am glad to be back here and i should like to feel that my visit has not been in vain with the university of missouri it is not in vain on my part in view of the honor that i am to receive it is as if all the world has risen up rejoicing that i will be out of the way soon the jealous part of the world the jealous part of it they began to confer honors upon me several years ago only they were 
in a little too much of a hurry. I was not ready to start that soon. When Yale conferred upon me the degree of Master of Arts, there were a great many people who were ready to inquire what kind of arts I was acquainted with, what kind of business I proposed to run. Then, when the degree of Doctor of Literature was conferred upon me, there were people who were unkind enough to question what I was going to doctor, and say, he don't know anything about art. What can he do about anything along that line? Or, yes, he will have plenty of practice in doctoring his own literature. Now that I am doctor of laws, there will be more queries of that kind. People will be saying now, what does he know about doctoring laws? But that's all right. We won't borrow trouble. It is perfectly right that I be made doctor of laws. People who doctor the laws and the people who make the laws do not have to obey them. Their share of the duties is in making them. I think it was intended for me when the Swiss bell ringers played the last rose of summer. I am that rose, the last rose of my summer, I suppose. I shall not be here any more, I imagine. I am not an expert in music. I am not trained. I do not know the first principles of music, and I should say that there are no standards of music, none at all, except for those people who have climbed through years of exertion until they stand upon the cold alpine heights where the air is so rarefied that they can detect a false note and they lose much by that i do not detect the false note and it took me some time to get myself educated up to the point where i could enjoy wagner i am satisfied if i get it in the proper doses but i do feel about it a good deal as bill nye said he said he had heard that Wagner's music was better than it sounds. He jocularly referred to the compliments that had been paid to Mr. Hitchcock. I could, however, have paid him a few compliments myself, and added one or two that he forgot to tell the gentleman. I have known him a long time. I did not know there was so much to his credit. I did not know the same of the other cabinet doctor. I am really so glad I did not know that Mr. Wilson was a Scotchman. I have known him for a long time, but he has concealed that fact from an ulterior motive, no doubt. I do not know how a man could have known him for so long a time and not discovered it. All Scotchmen are named either David Wilson or James MacDonald. He was trying to interest me in the music. He loved those Scotch airs so. But really I did not know that it was a Scotch air. But it is pleasant. I found out things about him that I never expected. In Mr. Galloway's case, he and I stand together. We stand together. We do not need any biography at all. I did notice a biographical sketch of me, and pretty soon I... I... I won't say anything about it. I wish it was the disposition of these jealous men here to let your biography alone. There are naturally things in it that you would not confess to everybody. 
this mr galloway returned to missouri when i did he returned after a few years absence i after sixty years absence and if he had waited as long as i did he would not be as respectable as i am i should be sorry to go away from this place go away from missouri feeling that i had left it as needy as it was and you understand that if i should forget to properly state my thanks for the honors that have been conferred upon me it is only an oversight i will present them as soon as i can get them raised in my head uh, since i have been in missouri i have distributed more wisdom than ever before and i am sure that much good will result from my visit i have had many honors conferred upon me but i deserved them all i sometimes suspect when you confer these honors you mean it as a sort of hint that i have been with you long enough some of the eastern colleges seem to be rather in a hurry about getting me out of the way and began conferring honors upon me years ago but as i stated before i deserve them all and am always willing to accept anything in the way of honors that you have to offer in the course of the several days i have been here in missouri i have noticed some most remarkable changes what i notice particularly is the change in moral elevation the elevation of morals which has come about since i was here not that i had anything to do with it but it is so and i know now that i recognize what the standards for changes are and gone higher that things which were then considered of minor importance are now considered to be serious things a newspaper said the other day that i while a boy up in hannibal used to steal watermelons and peaches and i knew from the tone of voice it was said in that it was meant as a reproach although in my time we should not have regarded little things like that while we did do these things when i was a boy i do not think it is quite proper to say that we stole peaches we took them we would not want to apply such an epithet everybody took peaches i think the grown people as well as the younger ones took peaches i believe that i can honestly say that i have never stolen as much as a ton of peaches we did take watermelons i do not know that there was any harm in it the first time i ever stole a watermelon i think it was the first time i stole that watermelon i removed the watermelon from a farmer's wagon while he was attending to another customer and i took it down into the seclusion of a lumber yard i took that watermelon there and broke it open and well, it was green the greenest watermelon ever raised in the mississippi valley well how we are affected by little things the minute i saw that that watermelon was green i was sorry sorry and i began to reflect now reflection is the beginning of reform when you have committed a sin if you do not reflect upon it and upon the probable consequences upon your character and career that sin has been wasted upon you it is just as well that it had been committed by someone else but i began to reflect and thence came the reform this is it the result which you now see before you i began to reflect and i said that i had done wrong to steal a green watermelon now then 
when you have done wrong what should you do next what would george washington do in such a case why there is only one thing for him to do there is only one right and righteous thing for any high-principled boy to do and that is to restore it restore it to its rightful owner that is what george washington would do and i said that is what i will do not many boys would have done that and the moment that i made that good resolution i felt that moral upliftment which comes when you have been doing the wrong thing and have then conquered the evil one i felt that uplifting and i took that watermelon back and restored it to the owner that is what was left of it and i made him give me a ripe one even at that early age my teaching proclivities had developed to some extent and i began to teach him that he had done wrong i went to him and told him that he ought to be ashamed of himself working off green watermelons on people that had confidence in him and i did not spare him i told him if he did not break off that habit he could not have any more of my custom and he was ashamed and promised to do better and he showed that his reform had begun and was sincere and he showed that he wanted to make reparation he went right down into the wagon and brought out another one it is so much better to sacrifice yourself that way for others why should you be going around selfishly remolding your own morals and neglecting your neighbors it is much better to look after his morals than your own and very much easier he just took his knife and plugged down deep into that watermelon took a piece out of its heart about six inches deep a great big red melon i told the man i would forgive him and he has long since gone to the great beyond he thanked the university for the great honor it had conferred upon him and i have taken it upon myself to believe that if it is not deserved which is a matter of no sort of consequence to the university of missouri i consider it all the more a compliment end of speech read by john greenman this is section 103 of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain remarks christening of harbor boat mark twain st louis june 6 1902 read by john greenman first of all no uh, second of all i wish to offer my thanks for the honor done me by naming this last rose of summer of the mississippi valley for me this boat which represents a perished interest which i fortified long ago but whose life i did not save and in the first place i wish to thank the countess de rochambeau for the honor she has done me in presiding at this christening i believe that it is peculiarly appropriate that i should be allowed the privilege of joining my voice with the general voice of st louis and missouri in welcoming to the mississippi valley and this part of the continent these illustrious visitors from france i consider it just and right that i should be allotted this from the fact that for many years i have represented the people of the united states without special request and without salary as special ambassador to the world we owe much to the french and i am sure that we will always remember and shall never forget it 
we are glad to welcome these visitors here to show them the results of what was done long ago by their ancestors and we are glad to point out the fact that st louis is a french city when la salle came down this river a century and a quarter ago there was nothing on its banks but savages he opened up this great river and by his simple act was gathered in this great louisiana territory i would have done it myself for half the money the name of la salle will last as long as the river itself will last until commerce is dead we have allowed the commerce of the river to die but it was to accommodate the railroads and we are grateful we have here with us a man who tells me he knew this river in the early ages pierre chouteau who says that he can remember when he could jump over it and i believe that statement because he made it under no other circumstances would i i have come across a quality of veracity here in st louis which is new to me it is the development of these later ages i must call your attention to the fact that on this boat you are quite safe i am here with a knowledge acquired long ago with the peculiarities of these waters which is so pleasant to the strangers from the color it bears and from its taste but you will have to take the testimony of others for that now the governor and the mayor have utilized their opportunities to advertise the world's fair and i have taken the occasion to advertise myself so there is nothing remaining but to again extend that welcome to our illustrious guests and to assure them that that welcome is heartfelt and sincere and i am sure that we will spread open to them wide the doors of the whole continent end of remarks read by john greenman This is section 104 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Remarks Unveiling of a Tablet Commemorating Eugene Field, St. Louis, June 6, 1902. Read by John Greenman. My friends, we are here with reverence and respect to commemorate and enshrine in memory the house where was born a man who by his life made bright the lives of all who knew him and by his literary efforts cheered the thoughts of thousands who never knew him i take pleasure in unveiling this tablet to eugene field end of remarks read by john greenland This is section 105 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Speech on Art Art Students Association Luncheon for Mark Twain Museum of Fine Arts, St. Louis, June 7, 1902 Read by John Greenman Ladies and gentlemen, and the Art Students Association, I am sorry myself that that mistake was made and i do not know how it was made i was promising myself a long sojourn here with you and through that misfortune i am to lose that i am to go straightway to some other place and do some other thing i don't know what it is something for the furthering of the public good or the advancement of civilization but if i could only stay here a little longer 
i should like to go into a disquisition of some sort concerning art now that i feel reinforced for work like that by this degree which has just been conferred upon me i have always had the impression that i was intended for an instructor in art but i never have felt full confidence because that sort of recognition which is the sort of thing that gives confidence had not arrived just as soon as you become a master doctor of arts you know all about it for you have a better opportunity to know and from that moment you are competent to teach in these high matters of art i feel now entirely competent to teach before i should have considered that what i might offer in the matter of instruction would properly be considered a matter of opinion but now i consider it is a matter of law i consider that now i know how to talk to you on art a long time ago when i used to examine the old masters on the other side of the water i did not consider myself competent to teach other people but i did consider myself competent to teach myself but i found as i went along that i had overestimated my ability in that line too for i was not able to appreciate i was not able to find in the old masters the joys which other people found there i could not find beauty or anything to enthuse me in a st sebastian stuck full of arrows moreover i objected to every st sebastian that i ever saw because they all seemed to be enjoying it and i said that old master that considers that saint or sinner can be a pincushion of arrows and smile does not know human nature and his art is all wrong many things in art i was not able to see i did not know what i wanted to see i went into the piti palace where they have those treasures of art as they call them and there was a titian venus five or six feet long on a bed sixteen or seventeen feet long with a dog close by that you could put in a snuff-box the drawing and perspective were all wrong the drawing was atrocious to me and i finally said to a man who was away up in art what do you find in that picture he said it is not worth while for me to tell you because certain qualities are required in order that you shall see the marvels in that picture and you are not qualified to see them you are born with a lack that cannot be supplied by education you cannot learn and you may as well give it up and he told me about a lady who said to turner once why mr turner i have spent many years in venice at one time and another but i have never seen the colors in the grand canal that are in this picture of yours and he said don't you wish you could meaning that she had not an educated eye there are two things concerned there in the first place natural ability that can be educated a vision that can be educated so that by and by you can see everything that is in a great picture but without that original equipment reinforced by education you cannot expect to see those things in the great masters that 
thought struck me and i began to see that there was a reason why so many went as i did through the galleries of europe and came away disappointed at finding there nothing that was entitled to the vast enconiums that they had heard pronounced and i saw that there must be something i could not understand finally some one taught me what i have been intimating that if you have no natural gift for art then it is not worth while to meddle with art if you have a natural gift it is not going to be valuable until you have the right teaching a man in hartford came of a race of painters they were good painters in the view of all new england one of them was this young man who had been painting pictures quite satisfactorily for several years and was making a handsome reputation one day that greatest clergyman that the last century produced rev dr bushnell a man regarded as authority in every possible way in that region came into mr flagg's studio and flagg recognized that it was a great honor indeed and he welcomed him with deference and enthusiasm he was proud to know that dr bushnell would now see what sort of an artist he was dr bushnell went to the easel and looked at a picture evidently with an absorbed interest and the pride and satisfaction was growing growing in flag's soul he probably intended to tell his parents about it when he got home finally dr bushnell said you must learn to draw that was a thunderbolt out of the blue flag thought he knew how to draw but bushnell said no 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 you must learn to draw then he said where is your library flag said there it is it was a shelf full of french novels bushnell shook his head and said do you know mathematics and flag said no then you must learn mathematics this struck flag as odd mathematics was a thing he did not know he must know but bushnell said you must learn and then he said have you ever dissected a human body and flag said no you must learn to dissect a human body then he looked the picture over again and said all these things are necessary in order to educate your eye you must learn to see flag said he thought he knew how to see no bushnell said i mean no offense when i say it but really in this picture i see that you have only the vision of a cow by that i mean that you see only the outside of things in your daisies your trees your weeds you see only the outside your spiritual vision has not been educated you have the vision of a cow a cow admires and knows a daisy as much as you do and if she could paint that is the kind of daisy she would put on canvas you must not remain with the vision of a cow you must get the finer and higher vision that comes through teaching under competent masters flag said what shall i do dr bushnell said go to paris go to the beaux-arts don't waste your young manhood here in this uneducated work go to headquarters learn to do it right good-bye he went away and flag sailed for france the next day he was convinced he sailed with his brother and he convinced him without trouble 
his brother was an artist of repute and had a fine opinion of his abilities when they arrived they found they had an afternoon to spare and they went straight to the louvre and wandered along through looking at this old master and that old master until they had examined an acre or two of old masters and yet they expressed no opinion in words and finally they came to the mona lisa you say it and the other said no you say it and so it was my flag who said well this is the mona lisa this is the picture that we have heard so much about and have worshipped from a distance because other people did in books it is just an old smoked herring then when they came before the teachers in the beaux-arts one of the teachers said what is your grade how far have you reached they said we paint in oils and the teacher said from what and they said from nature and he said let me see you draw something so they drew something and he said well it is not time yet for you to begin colors not time for you to begin to paint from nature first let us learn to draw he put those boys at plaster busts and taught them how to draw a dry goods box and kept them at it three months he made them buy a corpse and dissect it he taught them mathematics he gave them the whole course just as bushnell had advised in six months they had not had a holiday and were worked nearly to death one day they looked into the louvre galleries again and looked at those same masters all along those acres of old masters and finally arrived again in front of the mona lisa they looked at it a long time in silence and one said you say it and the other said you say it well he said i will it is true we had the vision of a cow it was the very verdict that bushnell had rendered so long before now they said we recognize that we did not know how to draw or paint in colors we did not know how to paint nature and we might have learned it earlier if we had had somebody to advise us that is my lesson for you to convey to the incoming class you do not need it yourselves and as i have not time to wait for the incoming class you will have to teach it second-hand from one whom you know to be a master doctor of arts and competent end of speech on art read by john greenman this is section 106 of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain dinner speech lotus club dinner for general horace porter new york june 17 1902 read by john greenman the chairman has told the truth he hasn't had much practice but he did it this time i did say that i should be very glad indeed to say something in case anybody preceding me should furnish me a text that anybody preceding me should furnish you statistics that need to be corrected or facts of any kind that seemed feasible things did not occur to me it is my line to correct them i have stood for truth all my life i have been a sort of symbol of veracity and it has not always been recognized but there have been things said tonight which furnish me here and there a text 
and they are pleasing texts i don't see that i have any real fault to find with anything that i have heard i didn't quite like to hear men whose heads are still brown like the chairman's and black like the guests talk too much of people who have been in this club longer than they have meaning me and to hear them calling your distinct attention to the stuff which i wear upon my head and which has been tanned to its present tone by hard work in the interest of civilization i have first to correct an opinion of the guest of the evening as everybody can have an opinion compliments are paid to him in a gracious way and in a truthful and righteous way the way in which mr lawrence has turned these compliments when he speaks of this brilliant bird of passage from the coal hole of the lotus club i like to hear him pay these compliments i like to see the chairman show off what he can do with language and i like to see him throw out his culture and his knowledge in this mysterious way and talk about the date of the battle of bunker hill just as if he was there and knew all about it he throws out this historical information with a scandalous air of having it always on tap he has been studying a cyclopedia today there was a man here who knew the date of the battle of bunker hill i don't take these random historians at par i shall look myself when i get home and see if they're right why general porter stands up here and he also throws out very nice things and sometimes they suggest wagner's music from the pen and point of view of bill nye bill nye said that he had heard that wagner's music was better than it sounded you can take what general porter says in the same way now he has been abroad over five years and has been working in my interest and mr armor's interest trying to get our literature introduced our pork from the pen well that is a good thing to do and he has been and is working very hard and has done admirably well he has sold more than forty copies of my works in france every year and it was only half that when he went away he has done exceedingly well and we have never had a representative there who has done his work more to my satisfaction than general porter and he has been learning french i wish he had made his speech in french not because any one would have understood it i could not have understood my share perhaps but i should like to hear him i think general porter did know french before he went away he has complimented me on my study of the german language i think i did yeoman service in trying to tame that language i had not the same success with it that he had with the french i have great reverence for the german language i did the best i could with it i stood by it many years i worked it hard and it worked me hard there were many pleasant incidents connected with the struggle we had a very dear old lady a sweet old soul who took a great fancy to a young lady who was traveling with us she took so strong a fancy to that young american woman that she poured out her practical german affection upon her and she couldn't say too much or find too much to praise in that young person and everything connected with her and this dear old lady was always trying to find similarities between the germans and the americans 
and was always delighted when she could show a sort of relationship in methods of expression and feelings and she said one day why you talk the same as we talk we say ach gott and you say god damn but the remarks of admiral barker carry me back to the time when i was in austria that was the time when the war broke out it was threatening daily that spanish war and the admiral says that americans are more comfortable there on the other side and are now treated with higher regard than they were at any earlier time it is no doubt true at the time i speak of eighteen ninety eight americans who were sojourning in vienna had a sufficiently uncomfortable time for it was said it came from america that we were going to fight spain for cuba's sake and that our sole reason for that was the humanitarian one that we were going to put forth our strength to achieve the freedom of the downtrodden cubans and that we should not charge anything for that but would do it simply from our american principle of standing by weak nations who were struggling for their freedom and ask nothing for that but the consciousness of doing this thing they thought we were too selfish to pour out blood and treasure for that cause i had to stand hearing people say in all kinds of german with languages mixed that that was all nonsense folly romance humbug that we had an ulterior motive for that war and that our humanitarian purpose was a mere pretense i had to stand all that everybody in that country had to stand that and put up with that it was hard enough because i believed thoroughly that we had no object in view but the high and noble one of setting that people free and i said it and i instructed the young american people younger than i was and we were in trouble and met with scoffs on all hands and jeers and i strengthened them and i said to them don't you be afraid it is all true absolutely true speak out and say so these people don't understand fighting for any purpose such as this but we understand it and we do it stand by your flag and don't be afraid we went all through that and we have waited to see the result and now i should like to stand in vienna and say see what we have done we have done everything we have kept our word we set those cubans free we said we should do it and we did it if there is anything in this world we have to be proud of for a long time it is that fact i am glad i have lived long enough to be able to say to those viennese that i was right and they were wrong general porter has done a great many things to be proud of and a great many things for which we have reason to be proud of him more than one of you have understood in one way or another what general porter has accomplished in that short life which has resulted in that black head of his men get older some time or another all of you know how brilliant he is he should have a school he has done some meritorious things but you haven't heard of the greatest victory he ever won on the battlefields or in the diplomacy of paris over wise men i saw him put to a test one night that would have taxed any other man severely he saw it through 
and i should tell you about that for his everlasting credit fifteen or twenty-five years ago the fellow craft club was formed they had sixty-five members and they held one meeting very successfully that i remember at this meeting mr gilder was chairman and just for fun i made a proposition i got major pond to say to mr gilder that there was a young man here from down south who had a plan by which he proposed to teach young men how to make after-dinner speeches without any preparation he would teach them how to choose any subject take any text and speak to that text without embarrassment of any kind mr gilder didn't want to introduce this young person but he was persuaded to do so major pond said that this man's name was samuel langhorn langhorn is part of my name and when he stated what the man's name was he said he hoped the club would call for mr langhorn and then mr gilder called it out i stepped forward i said there is no swindle about this langhorn is part of my name i wanted to try this project and i wanted a class to teach people after dinner speaking i wanted to try it on the dog as the actors say and i wanted to make the experiment there my scheme was this and it is based on this that as a rule after dinner speeches seem to me to consist of anecdotes and remarks attached from observation it seemed to me that the anecdotes are made for the speaker and just this a man gets up on his feet to make a speech and he talks along and talks very handsomely presently he approaches an anecdote you can see it in the air you can smell it and presently he says now how felicitously what i have just been saying is illustrated in the case of the man who and then he tells the anecdote and those people are caught and they laugh and the thing goes off and it doesn't occur to them that that anecdote didn't illustrate a thing but that doesn't matter he talks along and presently he brings out another anecdote and they still don't notice that it doesn't illustrate and the man goes on and takes out these anecdotes and the people go home and after all his anecdotes never illustrated anything he had to say and then i got those people to give me a text to show them what i could do with it and i asked them to send around a hat and have everybody propose a text i said it would make no difference what the text was one was just as good as another on this plan and after that they sent a hat around and somebody reached in and got one out the text i got was portrait painting well it wasn't much of a text considering what i knew about that subject but i said that would do one was just as good as another and then i began to deliver the facts and the history about it starting back to the primeval man who sketched the mammoth and so on and every now and then i dropped in an anecdote i always said you can see how felicitously what i have just said is illustrated in the case of the man who and i went right along now you see the whole scheme everybody here ought to be able to act on this line he must have his anecdote ready and he must always remember to say you see how felicitously this is illustrated in the case of the man who there wasn't a man there who got through his speech because he never got to an anecdote without all those people jumping in to help him out until it got to general porter and general porter stood up there and told nineteen anecdotes 
they tried to shut him off to shout him down but they couldn't do it he introduced each one by saying you see how felicitously what i have just been saying is illustrated in the case of the man who there never was so much courage exhibited he took a text himself that truth is stranger than fiction he didn't illustrate it in a single instance he always said he did and it always carried and he finished most happily now all the anecdotes had been told before taken from here and there and general porter said it was true from his own personal experience he said he made a voyage across the atlantic a very stormy voyage you see how he handled the thing and he had the people's hair standing on end about the dangers and he got up on that that the ship was leaking and they had to keep at the pumps all the time day and night all the way and then he wound up why we pumped the atlantic ocean through her sixteen times that was his idea of truth being stranger than fiction everybody could see that it was i have immense admiration for general porter i have more admiration for him than for the tax assessor of tarrytown the tax assessors of tarrytown understand their business better than anybody else there are tarrytown people here tonight the way those tax assessors work is that in order to verify their figures they find out what the fellow is worth and multiply it by fifty-seven they would tax porter on his personal appearance if he lived there oh i am going to have a time up there i am up there and i have got to put an addition on that place i have got to get a chicken coop and you can't have a chicken coop in tarrytown without risking something i am going to build that one of chilled iron i'm going to save the coop itself when the assessor comes i don't propose to get taken up it is a great place i am enjoying the prospect of going there i haven't got there yet it's a great place it has a lower death rate and a higher tax rate than any place on the civilized globe but i welcome general porter back to his native shore i welcome him with all my heart i have a reverent affection for him and this feeling has grown with the years during which i have observed him he grows in my estimation all the time i have a great opinion of his abilities and a great opinion of his career as he has made it and great hope that he will make it greater in the future and if next time i don't have an opportunity to vote for theodore roosevelt for president i hope to vote for porter end of dinner speech read by john greenman